the Central Kerbin Alliance Network, is headed to Duna. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. Before his passing, Kennedy Kerman expressed a desire to send Kerbals to the surface of Duna and return them safely back to Kerbin. In order to fulfill that stated goal, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is first going to attempt to send a probe on a flyby and possibly orbit the Red Planet. This new probe will sail between the planets. It will be a type of mariner, if you will, and it will be packed with all manners of scientific equipment. The probe is also being equipped with a relay antenna so that future missions will be able to communicate back to Kerbin. While this probe is being put together in the vehicle assembly building, in the space plane hangar, a few modifications are being made to the Pathfinder shuttle in order to send it to Duna. The shuttle's nerve engine has already proven itself on a mission to low Kerbin orbit, so only a few modifications to the vehicle are needed. The shuttle's docking adapter is being replaced with a science bay, and a little bit more liquid fuel is being added. Other than that, the shuttle should be ready to go. For now, this probe will be launched first and survey the planet and the space around it. Then, if everything checks out, the shuttle will be launched on the next available transfer window. If everything works out, this will be the first probe to visit Duna. According to recently released intelligence reports, the Communist actually tried to reach Duna ahead of the Central Criminal Alliance Network. However, most of their attempts failed to even reach orbit around Kerbin. One of the Communist's most recent attempts, called Duna-1, did get very close. However, it had communications issues, and the Communists lost contact with it. So, while both sides struggle for control of Southeast Kerbin, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is hoping to show its dominance in space by reaching Duna first. This Mariner probe has been launched at a Duna transfer window, so shortly after circularizing its orbit around Kerbin, it will be plotting its ejection burn. The probe is packed with Delta V. Perhaps, after it is finished with its survey mission around Duna, it may be moved to orbit around Duna's moon Ike in order to scan it. So far, the Mariner mission is proceeding exceedingly well. The efficiency with the different burns means that the secondary mission to Ike looks very likely. Immediately upon reaching Duna's sphere of influence, the probe begins running all of its relevant scientific experiments. Scientists and engineers are wanting to know as much as possible about the space around Duna before sending Kerbal knots there. And now the probe begins making its closest approach. The first images of Duna are being sent back to engineers. Thankfully, engineers opted to put the large antenna array on this probe. Otherwise, the images coming back would be looking like some kind of paint-by-numbers scheme, like when the engineers were kids. At closest approach, the probe fired its engine in order to capture around Duna. Now, at its apoapsis, the probe is attempting to shift its orbit in order to get into a polar orbit around Duna. About 400 meters in altitude is ideal for the different equipment to scan the surface. This will help scientists and engineers plot a good landing location for the future crewed mission. With the probe now successfully deployed in orbit, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network takes contracts in order to scan its surface as well as accepting advanced funds for the crewed mission. The probe is equipped with a radar array, a multi-spectral scanner, and a high-resolution visual scanner. The visual scanner can detect anomalies, like the saucer found on the Mun. What secrets are there to be discovered on Duna? Only time will tell. For now, the first crewed mission is preparing to launch. Liftoff of Pathfinder Duna. To date, the Central Kerbin Alliance Network has sent Kerbals to the Mun, Minmus, to orbit around EVE, and now they're off to Duna. Duna will pose a whole new set of challenges for the Kerbals. Unlike the Mun and Minmus, Duna has an atmosphere. However, unlike Kerbin, it is very thin, but flight should still technically be possible. The atmosphere is thick enough that the shuttle should be able to aerobrake. This should provide a considerable Delta V savings for the mission. On the plus side with the thin atmosphere, it is thin enough that the nerve engine should work well enough to be able to get the craft back into orbit. Similar to the probe, Jeb and crew are burning at a transfer window 
they should be able to get an encounter with Duna directly from Kerbin. The Nerve Engine is a very efficient engine, however it doesn't have a lot of thrust, so these burns do take a lot longer. But the high specific impulse of the engine is the very reason it was chosen for this mission. As Jebediah finishes his burn, the craft gets an encounter with Duna. Now, a small mid-course correction burn is being plotted so that the craft will approach Duna from the equator. This will enable the shuttle to more easily reach its intended landing zone, the Midland Sea. Since the shuttle will be landing more like a conventional aircraft, it will need to find a location on Duna where the atmosphere is thick enough and the ground is flat enough that it can safely land. The Midland Sea is one of the best options meeting both of these criteria. While the shuttle is in deep space, Bob takes the opportunity to run a few scientific experiments. As soon as the craft enters Duna's sphere of influence, one final burn will be made to set up the aerobraking pass. If this is done correctly, the shuttle will not need to expend any fuel in order to land on the planet. A special tool called trajectories is used to help plot the aerobraking pass so that the crew will know when they are deep enough in Duna's atmosphere that they can safely slow down. Bob again takes the opportunity to collect as much science as possible in high space around Duna. He will not need to worry about gathering so much science in low space around Duna as the shuttle will spend some time in Duna orbit while it is waiting for its transfer window back to Kerbin. As the shuttle rapidly approaches the red planet, the crew is visibly excited. While many of the crew are veterans of the EVE orbit mission, this will be the first time to enter the atmosphere and land on the surface of another planet aside from Kerbin. At 50,000 meters, the craft starts experiencing the effects of the atmosphere. Just off to their right is the Midland Sea where they're hoping to land. As they rapidly descend to the atmosphere, Jeb is fighting desperately to regain control of the craft. Below 15,000 meters, the shuttle begins to fly more like a normal aircraft. However, the air is still very thin and Jeb has to increase the control authority on all of the different control surfaces. The shuttle also has some RCS blocks which Jeb will use to help keep the craft level as it approaches the surface. Jeb finds a mostly flat location, deploys the drogue chute, and tries to slow the craft down as it skids across the surface. Surprisingly, there are also some large boulders in this area. Jeb is careful to steer the craft and avoid any of those. After a very intense landing, Jebediah and crew have done it. They have successfully landed on the Red Planet. Jebediah raises the Seaken flag in honor of this momentous occasion. Bill also gets out, and his job is to repack the parachute. It may be needed again to help them land back on Kerbin. Finally, Bob gets out and begins conducting all the different science experiments that they brought with them. The amount of scientific information that the crew is able to gather is extraordinary. This much information should help the Central Kerbin Alliance Network gain a scientific edge over the Communists. The Kerbals back at Research and Development are really looking forward to all of this data. They have some interesting projects that they have in mind, and all of the data gathered on this mission may be just what it takes for the next breakthrough. With the time on the surface concluded, Jebediah begins the slow task of getting the craft back into orbit. On Duna, the nerve engine has a much higher thrust to weight ratio and is able to power the craft back up through the atmosphere and into orbit. As the shuttle gains speed, it also flies better and Jebediah has more control over the ascent. Once the craft ascends past 20,000 meters, it begins to fly a lot more like a spacecraft than an airplane. Unless there are any unforeseen mishaps, the craft should have plenty of Delta V in order to reach Kerbin again. And with that, the shuttle has left Duna's atmosphere. From here, Bob will now be able to conduct all of his low orbit experiments that he was unable to do on the trip to Duna. From here, they will wait for the transfer window and then make their way back to Kerbin. While I was recording this, I did have a couple glitches where the game would shift my encounters. The craft did have plenty of Delta V and I was able to make the necessary corrections. However, the Delta V budget ended up being a lot closer than I would have liked. While the shuttle makes its way home from a historic mission to Duna, it's hard to imagine that there is a massive conflict going on in Southeast Kerbin. Through a proxy war, the Communists and the Central Kerbin Alliance Network struggle for control of the region. It is actually due to that conflict that defense contractor Didi Kerman is not able to make this mission. 
His obligations with the military are currently requiring him to be in Southeast Kerbin for the moment. Due to those glitches I mentioned, the crew is forced to make several course corrections in order to get an encounter back with Kerbin. Hopefully, these end up being the only hiccup for the mission. Similarly to how the craft landed at Duna, the shuttle will be using aero braking to slow down around Kerbin. However, with the shuttle's greater velocity and Kerbin's thicker atmosphere, the craft will need to make several aero braking passes in order to safely slow down. The craft rapidly descends towards Kerbin with a periapsis around 30 kilometers. This should be enough to aero capture. The crew will need to be careful as some parts are less heat resistant than others. That is why the solar panels are mounted on top of the wings. So the elevons appear to be one of the least heat resistant parts on the craft. After the shuttle's first air braking pass, Jebedi has lost his primary means of controlling pitch and roll. Fortunately for the crew, this is Jebediah Kerman piloting this craft. If there are any Kerbalnauts that could safely land this shuttle, one of them would definitely be Jebediah. Jebediah quickly reassigns the control authority over his control surfaces. Jebediah adds roll control to the canards and pitch control to the rudders. He also banks as he descends into the atmosphere in order to change his orbital inclination. This way, on the next aero braking pass, the shuttle should be lined up with the runway. At his apoapsis, Jebediah will need to burn the engine slightly in order for the craft to line up properly with the runway. At his apoapsis, Jebediah burns prograde so that the craft will have a better chance of landing near the runway. And this is it. Jebediah is going to bring this damaged shuttle back in for a landing. Fortunately, the craft has expended most of its fuel and it will be a little lighter as it comes in. But will this be enough? Will Jebediah be able to land this craft safely? Will he have to ditch it in the water? Or will this historic mission to Duna end in a fiery mess at the end of the runway? The shuttle now descends into the atmosphere for its final air braking pass and landing. The shuttle descends to 50,000 meters as it passes over communist territory. They are now racing over the ocean. The lack of pitch control does cause Jebediah some issues. He will be unable to perform the S-turns to slow down as he approaches the runway. If the crew are unable to slow down in time, they will end up in the ocean just past the space center. At 30,000 meters, Jebediah is desperately trying to perform some S-turns to slow down the craft. However, there just is not enough pitch control to do that. Realizing he's going to overshoot the runway, Jebediah has some hard decisions to make. He's going to try and make his way to the island airfield. This runway is not as big. Will Jebediah be able to slow the craft down in time? Jebediah levels the craft out, deploys the chute, and safely brings it in for a landing. And the crew bring home quite the haul of scientific information. While Jebediah, Bill, and Bob were away at Duna, Didi has been conducting sorties in Southeast Kerbin. Didi's Phantom II is currently engaged with a communist fish bed. Didi locks on with his AIM-7 missiles and fires. He then launches one of his AIM-9s. The AIM-7s are radar guided and the AIM-9s are heat seeking. The communist MiG is also able to get a couple missiles off. But they detonate early and don't cause any damage. Didi turns and is able to get a lock on the enemy fighter. He fires his last AIM-9 missile. However, he is unable to score a hit. The MiG is able to successfully deploy countermeasures. Didi switches to guns and is able to score a minor hit. The MiG is banking hard, attempting to get onto Didi's tail. The MiG still has its K-13 infrared guided missiles. With the high G maneuver, the MiG is able to outturn the Phantom. The MiG quickly locks on and fires its two heat-seeking missiles. Immediately after firing its missiles, the MiG switches to its guns and unleashes a hail of bullets on Didi. Didi evades the missiles but his plane is struck by the cannon fire. Didi's Phantom is ripped asunder by the bullets. Bail out, Didi! Bail out! Didi? Didi? Are you there, Didi? Does anyone see a parachute? Didi? Didi? While the Duna mission was able to make its way safely home, Didi Kerman was not. The struggle against the communists will continue, but Didi 
will no longer be a part of that struggle. This is Echo 3, and thanks for joining me to discuss the Cold War. I will see you next time.